Good afternoon, my sisters and brothers. And I say that purposely because we're all sisters and brothers of the same God. We're all born in the image and likeness of Almighty God. And thank you for joining us for the annual Yom Kippur lecture. As you know, this lecture commemorates the Holocaust and honors the six million Jews who were murdered in the part of the Nazi systemic plan to exterminate the Jewish people. In Hebrew, it means the day of calamity. The ancient Roman poet Cicero once wrote, memory is the treasure and guardian of all things, of the importance of memory. And may I speak from the uh, Jewish scriptures of the importance of memory of the book of Esther. The book of Esther is named after a Jewish heroine. Esther, the niece and adopted daughter of Mordecai, is chosen queen in place of Vashti. She herself averts a pogrom planned against her people as the royal decree of extermination reversed against Haman, the enemies of the Jews. Mordecai replaces Haman and together with Esther works for the goodness and the joy of the people. The purpose of the book of Esther is didactic. The glorification of the Jewish people, explanation of the origin, significance, and date of the Feast of Purim on the 14th and 15th of Adar. The book was intended as a consolation for Israel, a reminder that God's providence actually watches over them, never abandoning the Jewish people. They serve him faithfully, but turn to him sincerely in repentance. My wonderful great friend, Alice Greenwald, in my viewpoint, is the 21st century Esther. Not it may be of averting pogroms, but she continues the sense of the memory as I echoed today before from Cicero. Memory is a treasure and guardian of all things. My good friend Alice, you can read her biography within the program. But more than I can say about her, she's the founder of the United States Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C., an outstanding job. But when I was a pastor down in the Silver Spring, Maryland, visited many times, a beautiful job. She's currently the president and CEO of the National September 11 Memorial and Museum of the World Trade Center. I've known Alice for over 14 years. We worked together in regards to the building of the museum and different matters. We agreed on some things, we disagreed on other things, but this one thing we learned as true New Yorkers, we agree agreeably and we disagree agreeably. She won the battle anyway. <laughs> we would kind you forth, my sisters and brothers, we realize the importance of memory. And for Alice, what she does, she perpetuates the memory not only because we use Holocaust Museum down in Washington, D.C., but now she helps perpetuate the memory of 9-11. And everyone in this room is affected by 9-11 one way or another. But I believe that these nightmares are going on. Nightmares when it would happen with the murder of Jew Jewish sisters and brothers in the synagogue in Pittsburgh, the murder of Muslims, in the, in the mosque in Christ Church, New Zealand, and recently the murder of Catholic Christians in churches and hotels in Colombo, Sri Lanka. Violence is no stranger to any religion. Well, look, look, rather than have a look at the nightmare, look at the importance of memory as a dream. And I conclude with the dream of Mordecai after Israel was saved. The Lord saved his people and delivered us from those evils. God works signs and great wonders. Such we have not occurred among the nations. For this purpose, he arranged two lots, one for the people of God, the second for all other nations. These two lots were fulfilled in the hour of the time, and the day of judgment before God among all the nations. God remembered his people and rendered justice to the inheritance. My sisters and brothers, may I present this year's speaker, Alice Greenwald. Good afternoon. You'll forgive me, I'm, um, I have a chair here just because I have a, a bad knee, I have a torn meniscus, but um, hopefully I'll be able to stand for the, uh, for the length of the talk. Um, thank you, Father Jordan. You know, as you were speaking, we, we did go through an awful lot together. 
And I'm always reminded of um, a phrase by a colleague of mine, um, Ed Linenthal, who said, you know, controversy is not necessarily a bad thing. It's just evidence of passion on all sides. And I always respected the passion with which you approached the issues that we struggled with. And, um, and I think that we came to a good resolution. And, and the best part is we now have a friendship, which is really wonderful. Um, I am very honored to share some thoughts about memory and what it means to remember tragic chapters of history as we gather um, to observe Yom HaShoah and bear witness to what is perhaps one of the most tragic events in human history, the Shoah, the Holocaust. Um, as you've just heard in my professional life, I have been in the business of documenting traumatic history and commemorating the victims of such historical events. For the past 13 years, first as director of the 9-11 Memorial Museum, and now as president and CEO, I have worked to envision and realize a memorial and a museum at the World Trade Center site focused on the events and aftermath of the 9-11 attacks. And before that, I spent 19 years with the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in DC, initially as part of the design team that created the permanent exhibition there, and later as the associate museum director. So as you might imagine, I have spent a great deal of time thinking about memory and why it matters. Over 40 years ago, as a graduate student in the history of religions, I was trained to focus on the past. But as a parent and a grandparent, I tend to focus much more on the future. My work with memory, museums of memory has taught me that the two are indelibly linked. Since we are marking Yom HaShoah, it will actually be next Wednesday and Thursday, but we're in the season of Holocaust remembrance. Let me start with the Holocaust Museum, a museum that is for many more a cause than a cultural attraction. This greater purpose was very much at the heart of the vision for the museum, whose founders called for a living memorial one that emphasized the distinct responsibility of Americans to remember an event that did not happen here, an event that was for all intents and purposes imported to the National Mall. But why this responsibility to remember? Yes, US soldiers had liberated some of the concentration camps in Western Europe. Survivors came here to restart their lives. And surely our nation has a continuing moral obligation to come to terms with what the historian Ed Linenthal has called a legacy of disastrous indifference to the Jews of Europe. Those who prepared the report of the President's Commission on the Holocaust in 1979 argued that a memorial museum, a physical embodiment of official remembrance, literally in the heart of our nation's memorial landscape, would not merely ensure that the victims of Nazism would not be forgotten. It would, they promised President Carter, and I quote, instill caution, fortify restraint, and protect against future evil or indifference. The museum was intended as a cautionary tale, a form of inoculation against indifference. And for these founders, there could be no separation between remembrance and conscience. A memorial unresponsive to the future they cautioned, would violate the memory of the past. The presumption in those early days of imagining such a museum could be summarized in the two words of the oft-repeated phrase, never again. And yet, and you've just heard um, in the litany of tragedies um, that Father Jordan just mentioned, we live in a world where the promise of never again rings hollow. Even as the Holocaust Museum was being dedicated in April 1993, the world was witness to another unfolding tragedy in the former Yugoslavia, as the battle for Bosnia engraved a brand new phrase, ethnic cleansing, into our collective consciousness. Within a year, 800,000 would be dead during 100 days of terror in Rwanda, as the world made excuses for its indifference. And since 2003, Hundreds of thousands have died in the Darfur region of Sudan, very pleased that finally the president of Sudan has been arrested. But while that was happening, the United Nations failed to apply the word genocide to a situation where some, it acknowledged, 
had been operating with genocidal intent. And of course, even more recently, we have witnessed the genocidal tragedy of the Rohingya people in Myanmar. Despite all the treaties and the conventions, and there is a UN convention on the prevention and punishment of the crime of genocide ratified 70 years ago in the aftermath of the Holocaust, and meant to be a deterrent to similar atrocities, despite all the memorials, the museums, and the sites of conscience proliferating around the world, even now, we cannot count on never again. It is now 26 years after the opening of the US Holocaust Memorial Museum, and 19 years since a British court affirmed the historical fact of mass murder at Auschwitz in the celebrated libel trial won by Deborah Lipsat over David Irving. We live in a world literally sprouting with Holocaust memorials, with new books on the subject published every year, with countless feature films and TV documentaries on the subject, and with Holocaust curricula mandated in thousands of secondary schools and colleges. Yet not only do we continue to witness and frankly to tolerate genocide, but there remains for many a shockingly limited awareness that the Holocaust ever occurred. And in recent years, we've seen a deeply troubling resurgence of anti-Semitism across the globe and here in our own country. Just one year ago, the Conference on Jewish Material Claims Against Germany issued a comprehensive national survey of Holocaust awareness and knowledge among adults in the United States. It found that 11% of US adults and over one fifth of millennials, 22%, hadn't heard or were not sure if they had ever heard of the Holocaust. Nearly one third, 31% of adults and 41% of millennials thought that two million Jews or less were killed in the Holocaust. The correct number, of course, is six million Jews and five million other victims, including Roma and Sinti, individuals with disabilities, homosexuals, Jehovah's Witnesses, Poles and other Slavic peoples, communists, trade unionists, and pacifists, as well as priests. And 41% of respondents and a shocking 66% of millennials, two out of every three, had never heard of Auschwitz. So why remember? There is a wonderful teacher of philosophy at Claremont McKenna College, John K. Roth, who has written about what he calls the ethics of memory. Memories are not entirely in our control, Roth tells us. For one reason or another, and I'm quoting, physiological or psychological, we may lose them. Without memories, we could scarcely be moral creatures, for history would dissolve and we would be able neither to identify one another as persons, nor to make connections on which moral decisions depend. But given the fact that we do have memories, we are creatures who cannot avoid responsibility, and moral responsibility in particular. Roth goes on to cite Elie Wiesel's sobering alarm, quote, if we stop remembering, we stop being. If we stop remembering, we stop being. With Wiesel as his starting point, Roth then makes the Alzheimer's analogy. And I quote, especially as we age, we can understand Wiesel's point in our personal lives. We dread memory loss. It means an enfeebled life. And at the end of the day, there is definitely a sense in which we stop existing when we can no longer remember. If we extend the personal experience to the communal, it would seem logical that if loss of memory leads to a diminishment of being a whole person, of being, in Wiesel's words, then to forget this history means that we collectively run the risk of being diminished as a society. Or simply put, we become a society of diminished human beings. It has always struck me that this concept is fundamentally rooted in the Judeo-Christian tradition, a tradition that elevates the act of remembrance to a commandment. The fourth declaration in the passage of the Hebrew scriptures that establishes the ethical constitution of a community bound by covenantal obligation, Exodus 20, verse 8, 
begins with the imperative, one word, zachor. It is the command to remember, in this case, to remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Here, a people recently enslaved and demoralized, a ragtag, loosely affiliated group bound by tribal relationships becomes transformed into a co cohesive community through recognition of their commonly held ethical obligations to one another, obligations made imperative through an act of remembering. <clears throat> they are commanded to recognize that through their very behavior, their productivity, the activity of their lives, they have the potential to mirror the archetypal act of creation, but only through remembrance. Put another way, if human beings have been created in the image of God, then the only way to fulfill that potential is to remember. Just a few days ago, my family and I, and perhaps some of you, sat down to a Passover Seder, which is of course the most obvious ritual of remembrance in the Jewish calendar, an annual reenactment of historical narrative to reinforce communal memory. But the Seder does more than preserve memory. It is an annual admonition rooted in a memory of enslavement and deliverance to behave with compassion. The Haggadah, the book we read at Seder, is an ethical chapbook. And the Seder, the family ritual designed to teach and perpetuate communal values to the youngest members of the tribe, becomes a living classroom in the ethics of remembrance. The text moves fluidly from the remembrance of slavery, and I quote, in each generation, each person, person should feel as though he himself had gone forth from Egypt, to the ethical consequence of that memory. You shall not oppress a stranger, for you know the feelings of the stranger, having yourselves been strangers in the land of Egypt. Remembrance is fundamental to Jewish liturgy and lifestyle to the very act of being. Observance Jews, and we know this, we're in Brooklyn, following the commandment of Numbers 15, 37, 41, wear fringes, tzitzit, on the corners of their garments. Why? To remind themselves to live an ethical life guided by commandments. The weekly Sabbath liturgy compels a recitation of a passage from Deuteronomy known as the Via Hafta, literally a catalog of the ways we can remember commandments. Teach them faithfully unto your children. In your, speak of them in your home and on your way, when you lie down and when you rise up, etc. This portion of the liturgy itself concludes with a postscript, to be mindful. And the Hebrew word here, that's the translation, but the Hebrew word is zikaru, you, in the plural. The plural you, the communal you, shall remember. All of us shall remember. Be mindful of my mitzvot, my commandments, and do them. So shall you consecrate yourselves to your God. The message is pretty clear. To be a people consecrated to God through lives lived with ethical consciousness, to be in fact fully human beings, remembrance is essential. Remembrance is no less than a prerequisite for moral conscience. At the heart of my work with memorial museums is this fundamental conviction that bearing witness to the unimaginable is the only way to imagine a way beyond it. The genocide of Europe's Jews teaches us, teaches us about human nature and the entire range of human behavior from unimaginable evil to extraordinary goodness. It demonstrates the potential for governments to abuse power and it epitomizes how civic, religious, political, and educational institutions can violate the very values they were created to uphold. During the Holocaust, countless individual members of professions traditionally relied upon to protect the public good became active participants in civil rights violations and ultimately even mass murder. The Holocaust underscores the consequences of apathy and inaction, demonstrating how governments, institutions, and individuals stood by and did little or nothing to prevent the near extermination of European Jewry 
as well as the persecution and murder of millions of others. As the extreme example of the disintegration of civilized behavior, the history of the Holocaust provides a lens through which we can refract our own decisions and actions, both personally and professionally. Yet within this dark history, there are stories that model the very opposite. The human capacity for empathy and courage, nobility of spirit and self-sacrifice. We learn from these stories too. We learn what we are capable of in response to the worst of human behavior. Maximilian Kolbe, a Franciscan priest born in Łódź, Poland, whose given name was Raymond, sheltered 3,000 Polish refugees, among them 2,000 Jews, in the friary he had built near Warsaw following the German invasion of Poland in September 1939. In May 1941, the Nazis closed that friary and sent Father Kolbe to Auschwitz, one of the six Nazi killing centers in Poland. There he became prisoner number 16770 and endured along with other prisoners, that is those who had not been killed upon arrival, the hardships of slave labor, repeated beatings and systematic starvation. Throughout this ordeal, we are told, he was a source of comfort and strength for others, sharing his ration of soup, his stale bread, hearing confessions and offering consolation. Auschwitz had a rule. When one prisoner escaped, 10 would be killed in retaliation. In late July 1941, a man from Colby's bunker was thought to have escaped. The Nazi commandant demanded that 10 prisoners be selected for punishment. One of those selected, a young man with a wife and children, cried out in anguish over his fate. Maximilian Kolbe stepped forward and offered his own life in place of that man's life. His offer was accepted, and he was left to starve in an underground cell along with nine others. Over a period of two weeks, he continued to minister to his cellmates, and was one of only four people still alive when the order was given to administer a lethal injection to the remaining few. He was the last to be killed. And we are told that on August 14th, with a prayer on his lips, he offered his arm to his executioner. The cell where Father Colby died is now a shrine. In 1970, he was beatified by Pope Paul VI as confessor of the faith. And in 1982, he was canonized as martyr by Pope John Paul II. In the work to create the 9-11 Memorial Museum, we very consciously applied the idea that an encounter with difficult history, experienced through the lens of memory, can, in the words of Harold Scramstead, an elder statesman of the museum profession, and I quote, have the power to inspire and change the way people see the world and the possibility of their own lives. In my nearly 32 years of working in museums that present traumatic history, I've learned that it is not merely enough to teach the facts. A museum can act as a catalyst, helping people turn knowledge into personal meaning and guarantee that remembrance of things past can transform our understanding of the present and our hopes for the future. Remembering the Holocaust encourages individuals to contemplate their obligations as citizens of a democracy, to examine their choices, and to ask themselves not only what would I have done, but also what will I do. <coughs> Learning about 9-11 can also prompt that same kind of deep self-reflection. In framing the visitor experience at the 9-11 Museum, we of course tell the story of that terrible day we examine the historical context that led up to the attacks, and we chronicle the days, weeks, and months that followed in an effort to place these events in both an American and a global context, a global historical narrative, and to try to understand their ongoing legacy. But the 9-11 Museum isn't just about documenting history. It is about fundamentally understanding our humanity. Like Father Colby's story in the context of the Holocaust, we tell stories of people who acted with extraordinary kindness and compassion on and after that most terrible of days, helping strangers evacuate, 
refusing to leave colleagues behind, even if doing so meant certain death, running into danger selflessly so others could live, volunteering at ground zero, doing whatever one could. That spirit of generosity and concern for one's fellow human beings was exemplified on the day of 9-11 in the person of Father Michael Judge. Like Maximilian Colby, Father Judge was a Franciscan friar and Catholic priest. He also was a chaplain for the FDNY, the New York City Fire Department. On September 11, 2001, he replaced his friar's robes with an FDNY uniform and rushed to the World Trade Center site. Father Judge entered the North Tower where an emergency command post had been set up. He went there to offer spiritual support and last rites. While praying, he was struck with a hail of debris flew into the North Tower following the collapse of the South Tower. <clears throat> he would be listed by the chief medical examiner of the city of New York as the first official casual casualty, the first official fatality of 9-11, victim 0001. The photo of five men carrying his body away from the site became known as the American Pietà. Father Judge's body was brought to St. Peter's Church, just a few blocks north of the World Trade Center site, where it was laid before the altar. And four days later, on September 15, 2001, 3,000 people gathered to attend his funeral, his funeral mass at St. Francis of Assisi Church. Father Judge's story speaks to our innate capacity to respond fearlessly and with grace in the face of human suffering, devastation, and evil. And those very attributes also apply to a friend of Michael Judge and a fellow Franciscan, my friend, Father Brian Jordan, whose story we also tell at the 9-11 Memorial Museum. In the aftermath of the attacks, clergy members of many faiths were granted access to the World Trade Center site to bless recovered remains and to comfort rescue and recovery workers who were confronted daily with the horrific evidence of death and violence. Among them was Father Jordan, who walked through the site on the first Sunday after 9-11 to offer Holy Communion. On September 23rd, he performed the service that came to be known as the Ground Zero Mass. The location was the base of an intersecting steel column and crossbeam that had been found in the rubble of Sixth World Trade Center just two days after the attacks. Perceived by many to be a sign of God's presence, it became known as the Ground Zero Cross. And on October 4th, Father Jordan presided over a ceremonial blessing of the cross. He would continue to conduct mass at the base of the cross every Sunday through to the end of the recovery effort in late May, 2002. Services were open to all without regard to religious belief or affiliation. For everyone, it was a symbol of hope, faith, and healing. The late Richard Shearer, commissioner of the New York Office of Emergency Management at the time of the attacks, and himself a Jew, described the cross to us some years later. Richie said, and I quote, it didn't matter what religion you were, what faith you believed in. It was life. It was survival. It was the future. It represents the human spirit. It represents good over evil how people will care for each other at the worst time and moment in their life, how people can put aside their differences for the greater good. We don't presume that the 9-11 Memorial Museum can or will stop terrorism. Just as genocide has been perpetrated even after the Holocaust, there have been terrorist attacks since 9-11, but witness to a terrible one just um, on Easter Sunday. Though we in New York did suffer the Tribeca truck attack in October 2017 and other tragic events in our country like the San Bernardino and Pulse nightclub shootings, thankfully none has been at the scale of 9-11. But we know that human beings have the capacity to do terrible things to one another. And we also know that while our law enforcement and counterterrorism experts work incredibly hard to prevent it, we probably do not have total control over truly bad people who have the means, the methods, and the motivation to do grievous harm. 
What we do have control over, and perhaps the only thing we have control over, is how we respond. We forget history at our own peril. In the two decades since the Holocaust Museum opened, there has been a shift in paradigm from the unquestioned presumption that an encounter with this history will ensure never again to a more tempered sense of purpose. It's no longer never again, but rather not this time, not on my watch. The shift is about choice, our choices. We cannot presume to eradicate the human tendency towards evil, the primal impulse towards fratricide. It may simply be a fact of existence. But we can choose how we, as witnesses to events unfolding in our time, will respond. Or, as the former US ambassador to the United Nations, Samantha Power, has written, we can no longer afford to be bystanders. We must, all of us, be upstanders. Ultimately, the commitment to remembrance is about encountering ourselves in the history being recounted, even if the memory is not ours personally. We must, as the liturgy admonishes us on Passover at the Seder, feel as if we ourselves had gone forth from Egypt, feel as if we had gone forth from Auschwitz or from Ground Zero. It is about constituting a community of ethical concern through an act of remembrance no less urgent and no less imperative than the biblical commandment to remember. It is about preserving memory so that we can remain fully human beings. In the Hall of Remembrance at the Holocaust Museum, there is an inscription from Deuteronomy. It is the command to remember, and it reads, only guard yourself and guard your soul carefully, lest you forget the things your eyes saw, and lest these things depart your heart all the days of your life, and you shall make them known to your children and to your children's children. What's at stake? As T.S. Eliot said at the close of his four quartets, not less than everything. We can best accomplish the act of remembrance through the mobilization of morality, of encouraging a self-reflective ethics of responsibility, of creating a community of conscience, a notion that brings us full circle to the biblical commandment itself, which presumed that for conscience to be mobilized, it had to be rooted in memory. The imperative is daunting, but the risk is nothing less than the loss of our humanity. As Wiesel warned us, if we stop remembering, we stop being. This is an existential imperative. There is a profoundly perilous gamble, implicit in remembrance without ethical consequence. If we remember without mobilizing conscience, we run the risk of losing the memory itself. And if we lose the memory, we risk our own diminishment. In writing about the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, historian Kristen Ann Haas observed that memorials are the way we make promises to the future about the past. When we gather on Yom HaShoah to remember the Holocaust, when we tell the stories of Father Colby at Auschwitz and Father's Judge in Jordan at Ground Zero, we are not remembering history as an end unto itself. We are encountering and re-encountering history so that as individuals and as members of a consecrated community, a community of fully human beings, we can better frame the promises we are willing to make. Thank you. As always, Alice, outstanding. Uh, we have time for questions, and we prefer we begin with the students. If you have any questions, please raise your hand and speak loud like me. Don't be shy like myself either. <laughs> any questions? Don't be shy. Don't be shy. Maybe even a comment. And not even to, maybe I should uh, present on, uh, uh, Alice for the response to your comment. Any comments? This is your generation, folks. You're the first generation to know about climate change, and you're, you're the last generation to do something about it. So this is your world. 
Thank you. Raise your hand, Kennedy. What's your What's your comment? Question, Kennedy. Uh, sure, sure. Uh, thank you very Please much. Please stand. Uh, my name is Tim. Hello, everyone. Um, in addition to, um, you talked about having some quotes, scriptural quotes in the museum to help people think about remembering and memory. What are some other ways you try to integrate that theme into your? Museum? What are some of the other ways? What you try to integrate that theme and try to help people to think about memory and remembering. Well, you know, um, I'll speak about the 9/11 memorial. How many people here have been to the 9/11 Memorial Museum? Good. Okay, that's a fair, a very good, a fairly good size. New Yorkers are our smallest demographic, so I'm pleased to see that. Um, you know, um, the entire experience of that museum is um, to trigger memory, right? In, and what's interesting is that we now have um, a generation coming up who have no memory of 9/11. When we started working on the creation of the museums. We started in 2006, five years after the attacks. And it was inconceivable that anyone would walk in that museum who didn't bring along their own memory of the event. It, it was witnessed by a third of the world's population, two billion people, on the day of 9-11, 2001. So it was impossible to imagine a world where people weren't bringing their own 9-11 memory with them. And yet, it's almost 18 years after the attacks, and there are young people in college who have no memory of that day. So the museum has to be a trigger of a memory you didn't have, not unlike the Passover Haggadah, right? You tell the story. And by telling the story, not as a historian would tell it, right? We're, not a, we're actually not a museum based on historical narrative because in 2006 there were no histories of 9-11. It was too soon. So we are telling a human story about a historical event. That's a difference. And when you tell human stories, people can empathize. People can relate. People can imagine themselves in that situation. And it allows for um, a kind of personalization of what might be an abstract history to become very real for people. So this is, you know, when you ask how do we invoke memory in the museum, we tell stories. We allow you to hear from people who were there. Uh, the use of first person testimony is integrated throughout the museum. Um, and for the people who aren't there to share their own story, the nearly 3,000 people killed on 9-11, um, we allow people who knew them to tell their stories, not us. Curators don't know these people. We didn't know them personally, but their friends, their coworkers, their family members, their neighbors, they knew them. So when you go in the memorial exhibition of the museum, you are listening to vignettes spoken by people who knew and loved the person they're remembering. And what you find is that what people tell about the people they loved is not how they died. They talk about how they lived. They talk about who they were what they did, who they loved, how they behaved, how they laughed, the dirty jokes they told. I mean, the most amazing things come out. And it's familiar, it's real. And you realize when you come out of that room and you're standing in a space covered, the walls are covered with the faces and names of nearly 3,000 people and you look at them differently because you are now realizing they're just like you. They're just human beings who got caught in the cataclysm of a horrific act of mass murder. Um, they were innocent, they were going about their lives, and they were murdered. And whatever the motivation was for that act is illegitimate. The act itself is illegitimate. Mass murder is not an acceptable form of negotiation for grievances. And yet we live in a world where it happens continuously. So how does a museum use memory to motivate conscience? You make people see themselves in the story. And the minute you see yourself in the story and you think, oh my god, I work downtown in a high-rise building. I'm on the 20th floor. It could have been me. I get out on an airplane every few weeks for business or travel. It could be me. It could be my children. It could be my neighbor. It could be my husband. It could be, you know, you begin to realize that it could happen to you too. It's not an abstraction. And you see the world, it's always too short, but the world comes together after these events. There's a sense of connection 
and of empathy and of compassion and of concern, and then it evaporates. Our job is to make that reaction sustainable because it's only by making that reaction of connection sustainable that we will get beyond the use of terror and mass murder as a form of negotiation. One quick comment, but then a question. Uh, I think it was Karen uh, Switzer in the Times mentioned that, well, this technology dulls memory or is eradicating this from body. But that's not, the president of Brazil said recently, uh, remember, but forgive. I'd like your comment. You have talked about memory, of course, I, we, I think we all agree that. What about forgiveness? I just want your personal reaction. To yeah, it's a great Thank question. There's, there's actually a lot of talk right now about um, forgetting being as important as remembering because so much of um, violence is rooted in retaliation and vengeance and cycles of violence and so forth and so on. Um, you know, I quote Nelson Mandela, actually. I think it was Nelson Mandela. May have been, well, some, somebody like Nelson Mandela, who said, um, you know, forgiveness is not the same as forgetting. And forgetting is not the same as forgiveness. Um, you, you aren't obligated to forget a wrong that was done to you. But you are obligated to try to forgive. And what forgiveness means is that despite what you remember, okay, you are willing to engage in a relationship with that other person. Okay, you can have a relationship with them and relationship is the beginning of forgiveness. Um, I am not one who believes in forgetting. I think that's the worst thing you can do um, because then you lose a sense of who you are and why you are. But I do believe in moving toward forgiveness, if you can, about relationship, because it's the only way you can be engaged. I'm Robin, I'm, I'm a senior. Uh, of course, I've been to the 9-11 Memorial here in New York, and I've also been many times to the Holocaust Museum that I, I bet, I bet. Uh, but I've never, I'm sorry to say, heard of the 9-11 Memorial in Washington, D.C. Are you part of the Smithsonian, and where approximately is your museum? Okay, so it's actually the, the Holo United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. It's not a 9-11 museum. It's the Holocaust Memorial Museum, and it is on the National Mall. Um, it sits between 14th and 15th Street, uh, just catty corner from the Washington Monument, um, not far from the Department of Agriculture um, and Constitution Avenue. Uh, it was founded and um, dedicated in 1993. Uh, it's a remarkable place, and I don't take by any means full credit for it. I, I worked with a, a remarkable team of people and um, you know, uh, really just inspired group of people to yeah, create but, that museum. But you pushed him, Alice. I know what you did. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it's, it's well worth visiting because it is, um, it's, it tells, it is also a storytelling museum, um, but it, it begins with the American perspective. And you are asked, as you move through that exhibit, to be a witness to events that didn't happen here, right? They didn't happen in the United States. They happened in Europe now over 70 years ago, a long time ago, but you were seeing it as if you were there. And you're constantly looking at images in which horrific things are happening, but each image that was selected for that museum shows witnesses, people at the window, people on the street, looking away, not engaging. And it is a, it's a cry to pay attention to the world you live in and not to look away but to step up and to, as Samantha Power said, to be an upstander, not a bystander. Hi, Marilyn. If I wasn't born in this country, I would have been in there, you know, in the oven, so what have you, as a Jew. I went to the Holocaust Museum when it opened in the 90s. I have never in my life ever seen a museum like this. You, I, I'm just I'm doing a segue on what you said. Yeah, yeah. It is so true. You walk from room to room. The use of light and darkness. I remember there was one room, I think, filled with shoes mm -hmm. or something that were taken, taken from the people who were killed. It was an exhausting, exhausting experience. 
you go into the um, cafeteria, and there, the good thing, there were classes of young children who are seeing this for the first time. It's like you, you lived it. And when I went back with my friend to the hotel, we had to go to sleep. Mm. We were so stressed out from this experience. And I have it in my, you're in my will. That's <laughs> why she's one of my best friends. <laughs> Next, anyone else, please? Yes, behind you. We'll do a couple more, and then we're going to go towards our lunch program. Yes, ma'am, and then we'll have, we'll have you next. Okay, I'm a journalist, and I was assigned to the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. I thought it was the best thing that I've ever seen. Currently, I think uh, next month, the, uh, the museum in uh, New York is having uh, uh, Auschwitz and the Holocaust, too. And they show the uh, train that they were put on before they were executed. So I want you to go to that museum because it's closer. The only thing that when I was between the two museums as a reporter, I felt that you did an excellent job, but the museum in New York was disappointing to me because once you went through it, they didn't have new exhibits enough for me to go back. Also, you had some- Are you talking about the Museum of Jewish Heritage downtown or the 9-11 Museum? Jewish heritage. Also, I found that you had a plays regarding the Holocaust in the museum in uh, Washington, D.C., but you didn't have it here in New York. Mm -hmm. I wish the New York people would put on plays that would bring the people in the museum to reiterate the situation about the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there is a, an exhibition that's going to open at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, which is in Battery Park City. It's opening, um, I believe, early next month. May uh, yeah, very, very soon. Um, uh, January third. Thank you. I, but I think it's for two years. I think it's going for two years. Um, which is a, the, the entire museum is being given over to a three-story exhibition on Auschwitz. Um, and it's supposed to be quite extraordinary. So I do, I, I second that. I encourage you to, uh, to see it. Thank you for your wonderful talk. I really appreciate it. I'm a, a professor here, and I brought many of my students here uh, who have come to talk to you. But my question is, how do we educate our students if it's not possible to take them to museums? I've tried. I've taken some of my students to museums, but sometimes it's just not possible. Mm -hmm. In one of my, I really liked your, your sentence, the human stories turn the abstract into reality. And in one of the classes, we read The Last Girl by Nadia Murad mm -hmm. to, to, to bring that home. But what, what, what are your suggestions to us of ways to educate the young? Because it is so important to do so if we cannot always take them to a museum. Well, you know, there are so many wonderful, wonderful books. You know, I can remember, um, you know, the, the, the first book I ever read about the Holocaust was was actually in Frank's diary, you know, which every child was reading at, at the time. And it is that personal story which allows you to connect. Um, any of Ellie Wiesel's books, I mean, Night is one of the most devastating books I've ever read. And it, it you know, it is the voice of a person who lived it. So it is his own, um, his own testimony. Uh, you know, I, I would go to books. I would, there are many movies that are wonderful um, whether they are documentaries or feature films based on books. Uh, you know, I mentioned Deborah Lipstadt's uh, libel trial. Um, there was a terrific movie about that. I can't remember. Denial, I think it was called. Denial. Um, which was terrific. And it was very true to the history. I know Deborah personally, and um, she doesn't look like Rachel Weiss, but that's okay. Um, but uh, Rachel got her, her uh, Queen's accent perfectly. Um, but it's, you know, I think there are so many resources. The, the, the question for me is not um, what to go to to learn about this, because there are so many resources. It's how do you sustain attention? Because you know, it's one thing to go to a play or to go to a movie or to read a book and just say, "Oh my God, that was so awful," and you know how horrible for this. And then you go on and you know you go on with your life. It's a normal human reaction. But then these things keep happening, and how do we, how do we mobilize as a human community to make sure that they don't anymore? And and I think we live in very difficult times. You know, we do, we do have a convention against genocide, but for political reasons, it's not invoked. It's not invoked. So what good is it? 
You know, it, 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 there was a, a sense after the end of World War II, uh, that generation said, we have an obligation to make sure these things don't happen again. And they ratified rules at the United Nations that said, you know, it, as a community of nations, it's our responsibility to call it out when we see it and to, you know, to humiliate the country that's doing it and to leave them out of the community of nations. Well, fine and good on paper. It sounds wonderful, but it's not used for political reasons. And that's real life, but it's also really troubling. And, you know, we, we need to figure out ways that if it's at a one-to-one -one level at an individual human beings or as a nation or as a world community, how we are actually going to contend with this. Because those poor families in Colombo and other towns in Sri Lanka, what they're going through is unthinkable. And yet we went through it here. And it happens and it happens and it happens. And when is it going to stop? And it's not going to stop by itself. It's only going to stop if we stop it. I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I, you had to light my face. I apologize. All right. I actually just wanted to thank the St. Francis College for doing this remembrance every year. Uh, as a survivor of, of the Holocaust, uh, and unfortunately, us witnesses are dying out. And it's very reassuring for me to know that you are to we will never forget, and that's because of Dr. Frank Macchiarola, who began this program over 20 years ago. Thank you. Thank you for your wonderful you. work, ma'am, and blessings upon you always. Folks, uh, we have the students have to get back to class. We have uh, lunch, uh, and a little refreshments out in the Callahan Center. We thank you very much. I uh, like that. Those we here, thank you. Those not here, they're lost. And I'm going to tell them off later on. God bless you all. God bless you all. Thank you for joining us. Please refreshments next door.